the women do serve front line because they have units out there where there are women in it and again when you're being mobilized to war it's not a question it's not like they're going to tell you okay you take a back seat and you know, we go in ahead of you and we'll be back 2012 was the hottest year on record in the continental United States, the lower 48. So, you know, again, if people look into it and do the research, it's pretty clear Sandy, as well as many of these other extreme weather events, are very much related to what's happening with our climate and the heating up of the atmosphere. The, the, one of the things that I learned, and I remember thinking this in the newsroom one day, how I w excited I was that I was going to be working for the Washington Post because it was such a, a wonderfully liberal organization. But I had not taken into account that it was still run by individuals, some of whom were literally racist. Alan's work understands the nature of I think, of this society, how the white race and white supremacy have been central in shaping it, how if we can challenge that effectively, we can move in a new direction. Broadcasting from New York City to the world, it's the G-Man Interviews. The Poorest Place in America is a documentary film that exposes extreme poverty and cases of substance abuse on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. The film, which is available on YouTube, also focuses on the fact that very little has been done to help the residents and that suicide is quickly becoming an option for many Pine Ridge teens and young adults. Joining us to discuss the problems plaguing the community is Pastor Leon Blunthorn Matthews a central figure in the film and author of Res Ramblings, Living on the Pine Ridge as a 21st Century Engine, which is available on Amazon.com. In the rich tradition and style of Native American storytelling, Res Ramblings is a thought-provoking collection of Pastor Matthews' newspaper columns and personal blogs spanning the past four years. He accounts the stark realities of poverty, oppression, racism, and cultural struggles of Native Americans. Welcome to the show, Pastor Matthews. Thank you. Before we delve into the situation at the Pine Ridge Reservation, could you explain the origin of your name, Blunthorn? Well, Blunthorn comes from my grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. and He was living in Wounded Knee at the time, and it was a winter camp for Lakota people for, for many years. After the Little Bighorn, which the Lakota called the Greasy Grass, he returned back to Wounded Knee and lived out his life. And he had a daughter named Susie, and she went by the name of Susie Rabbit. And then Susie Rabbit had a son named Aloysius. And then Aloysius had a son named Doug. And then Doug had a son, <laughs> many sons, named, and, and I'm one of Doug's sons. So I actually come from the Wounded Knee area through my father. But actually, Blunthorn, it should have been blunt force, because when he went into the enemy, he did it with a, a lot of force. But the translation came out as Blunthorn. So I took his name, as many Lakota people do, when they're given Lakota names. My mother wanted me to have his name, so I took his name. Complete this sentence. I was compelled to publish Res Ramblings as a book because... What I wanted to do was I wanted to do what Blunthorn did. And he was actually interviewed by James R. Walker in 1890. And here I am, his great-great-grandson. And I wanted the opportunity to give my grandchildren a view of what happened in the early 21st century. So that's why I wrote the book. And I had a publisher friend that asked me to, to start writing a column. And so I did. And she said, if you write enough columns, you'll be able to have your own book. And so when that happened, it was really powerful because, you know, I was started to write. And then within two years, it was like, it's not going fast enough. So then I started to blog. It's the compilation of both the, the column and the blog. And together, we have these short stories of everyday life in the 21st century. And so that's what the book is. And how long have you been a member of the Pine Ridge community? Well, I've been here since 1979. The United States government had a relocation program in the late 50s, and, or the 50s and the 60s. And what happened is my father received training, and then he was sent into the city. First, he went to Denver, back to Pine Ridge or Wounded Knee, 
And then from Wounded Knee, he moved to California. And I was born in 1965. And one of the things I like to share with people is 1965 was when I was born. But the country that I've come to love, the United States of America, is not the country I was born into. You know, one of the things that that is eye-opening is it didn't happen until 1968 where interracial marriage throughout the whole 50 states was legal. The United States Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to actually have mixed marriages in some state. They banned that. So, so now everybody can marry everybody because we're part of the human race. How and when did the devastation begin in Mine Ridge? Well, the devastation started in the 1870s. Basically, there was a man named Philip Sheridan. He burned Atlanta. Scorched Earth came about through his campaign during the Civil War. And, you know, this is a guy that set out to destroy. They didn't even pack anything. They basically got on their horse in a cavalry unit, and they went through the south and got to Atlanta and burned it down. You know, raping and pillaging and destroying. and I mean, very destructive in the Civil War. This came from the Union Army. And what happened was he actually came out to the west to help with the Indian problem, you know, quote, quote. And one of the famous quotes that Philip Sheridan said was, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, but they all look alike, so let's kill them all. And so this was a man that they sent out to the West to destroy the Indian population. The buffalo across the plains, it was numbered in the millions. And I believe that the number that they came down to was about 700. But the reason they tried to destroy the American bison was to destroy the food source for the American Indians so that they would be put into concentration camps. But the Indians kept leaving And so eventually they killed the food source, and then the Indians had to return back to the reservations to actually receive food and warmth. And so they were actually, they were concentration camps. So it started in the late 1800s. And as I noted earlier, The Poorest Place in America chronicles a lot of the problems that you're having in the area with regard to alcoholism and suicides. But recent news reports and studies have revealed that alcoholism and suicide are becoming commonplace on a number of reservations across the country. What makes the situation in Pine Ridge so unique? Well, part of it is the Oglaw Sioux tribe is the last people group to, to actually give up. And it happened in 1890 with Wounded Knee, the massacre at Wounded Knee. You know, after destroying Custer at, in Montana... In that territory, the 7th Cavalry was actually put back together and came up and and they basically slaughtered hundreds of Lakota people. And, you know, Pine Ridge officially started in 1889 and it was one year before the the massacre happened in 1890 at Wounded Knee. And the Oglala people, you know, we have a very large land base and Pine Ridge has been notoriously one of the poorest counties in the nation for you know, probably ever since it began, you know, ever since they put together a county. And the main county is Shannon County. You know, we number about 40,000 people living on the Pine Ridge, but the numbers don't show in the census because people don't trust the government. You know, the government has, has always set out to, to be destructive toward Native Americans and especially to the Great Sioux Nation. And so Pine Ridge is one of the last people groups standing against the United States government. And, you know, when... When they defeated Custer, they actually captured the flag. And back in the the first Gulf War, you know, Shannon County had the most men per capita to go into that war and to fight for freedom for Iraq or whoever. You know, so they have been pro-American at times as well. But um, as far as the alcohol, I believe that it's a lack of hope. You know, people in Pine Ridge have been living without hope because they believe that tomorrow isn't going to get any better. And now we have the highest suicide rate. I mean, I mean, six or seven times higher than the national rate, you know, which America has the highest suicide rate of all the, the modernized countries and native America has a six times higher rate. And right now in Pine Ridge, we've had, I mean, I I heard a, a number just the other day where there were about, 300 people that attempted suicide within the, in 2012. 300. And, yep. And those are just documented. Then you have the issues of alcoholism that is a suicide 
which takes a little bit longer because you know they don't want to fill anymore they start to medicate and they start to be destructive in their lives and one of the things that I hope to help people understand is, is that even on the Pine Ridge Reservation today, you know, we're, we're considered a dry reservation. Sorry, could you explain what that means, a dry reservation? Oh, okay. A dry reservation is where alcohol has zero tolerance as far as for consumption. You cannot bring any alcohol here. You cannot drink any. You can't sell it. They have zero tolerance. That's what our tribal laws state. Okay. But but unfortunately, you know, today there's a grocery store just a block away from me and they sell hairspray. And there are men that go in there in the mornings between 8 and 10, I don't know, maybe all day long. And what they do is they actually, they take the hairspray and they pour it into like a milk jug, an empty milk jug, and they fill it with water and then they drink that. Because it's got an alcohol base. Yep. And it's a wood alcohol and that stuff will cause blindness and so the laws on the reservation say there's no alcohol sales the people are still finding alcohol even in the hairspray and the hand sanitizer people are drinking hand sanitizer today because they're losing hope just so I'm clear there's no alcohol being sold whatsoever at that grocery store no are there any other means by which residents of Pine Ridge are getting alcohol well, the, just across the border, I live in the main village of Pine Ridge, and just two miles away is White Clay, Nebraska. And White Clay, Nebraska has, sells about three to, I don't know how many millions, three million cans of beer a year. And in all of that beer, the majority of it is 95% or 98% or whatever it is, you know, is coming back across the border onto the Pine Ridge, which is a dry reservation. And so, and the police cannot stop it. I mean, people are bringing it in here by the car loans. Pine Ridge is, is located within the exterior boundaries of South Dakota, but we do have an extension into Nebraska. So which part, as far as the story is concerned, which jurisdiction is involved? The South Dakota's jurisdiction or the Nebraska jurisdiction? Well, South Dakota does not have jurisdiction on the reservation. It's gotcha. a, you know, Pine Ridge is is very unique as many I mean there are some reservations that where states step in but Pine Ridge has no state jurisdiction as far as you know how they handle the policing of it and so it's all done by the Oglaw Sioux tribe through a 638 contract with the United States government and the United States government helps to pay the the salaries of our police officers there are those who might say if a person chooses to drink and not seek treatment they have no one to blame but themselves for their misfortune or outcome. How would you respond? Sheridan County is just across the border. Sheridan County was named after Philip Sheridan. The next county to the west of Sheridan County is Dawes County. The Dawes Act was an actual act of Congress where it took away most of the land and they gave each person on the reservation a set part of land and then they opened it up to settlers. Well, just south of the reservation, there was supposed to be a 50-mile buffer zone and where the, nobody was supposed to be in that area. But through the Dawes Act and through other acts of Congress, that land was opened up. And then the whiskey traders quickly moved in. And people probably sold land for whiskey. And, you know, it's really destructive because the United States government has had policies up until the mid to late 70s where it was to destroy Native America. And so there was an effort to cleanse the land of all Native Americans. And when people, you know, we do need to have personal responsibility. That's why, you know, for me, I'm an advocate of opening up the sale of alcohol on the Pine Ridge Reservation because people need the opportunity to choose rather than to, to begin to medicate. And so there are a lot of issues as far as the whole idea of personal responsibility. But when you have the most powerful government in the history of the world setting out to destroy you, you're going to have some issues as far as the, the choosing of drinking or choosing alcohol over a non-alcoholic life. You've noted that there were about 300 attempted suicides on the reservation. But do you have any idea how many confirmed suicides have taken place? I don't have those numbers because I don't work in suicide prevention, but I play basketball. You know, I know I'm 47 years old, 
and I got an opportunity to play against some great players. But I know one one young man who just he he decided that he was causing his family too much problems, and and he just ended his life, and that was just in December. So it's recent and it's raw. I mean, just in January, another young man killed himself. He's probably about in his early 30s, took a gun and shot himself. So those are just two men within the last couple months that I know of. And so there are numerous other people that have, have done it. I heard of a young lady. So as I'm thinking back, there is a lot of suicide on the reservation. And, you know, I just don't have the numbers to, to give you a clear description of it. As a pastor, how are you and your church attempting to deal with this and other issues? I've been a pastor since 1995, and you know, I'm beating my head against the wall. And what's happening is really interesting because for 17 and a half years, I've been doing the same thing over and over and over, trying to preach the good news, trying to help people to find hope. But in the end, it's it's like if, if you give people Christ, give them you know, the good news, the, the message of Jesus, what happens is their lives never change. So even though they receive Christ into their lives, you know, what happens is the surroundings don't change. The poverty is still there. You know, nothing is, is changing in their lives. I mean, I have people that are debating whether or not to, to buy a cheap piece of hamburger versus toilet paper. I mean, when that's ridiculous in America today, it's like, why are people making choices between bad hamburger or bad meat and and toilet paper you know most of the americans in in this country don't even think about that and so what i'm doing today is i'm developing bluntorn productions and it's an llc limited liability company and what i hope to do is to build wealth so that i can help empower other people in the last 10 years we built a coffee house we built a sound studio and we built a garage for a mechanic and those are three projects that I'm very proud of but I think more needs to happen because people need to find hope but right now working as a nonprofit as a church you know we can't a charitable organization we don't have the means because eight or nine out of ten people do not work on the reservation so what I'm trying to do is create a company that's gonna help hopefully build some wealth and be able to empower the people, the young people, to, to live out their dreams. I received an email alerting me to what was happening in Pine Ridge, which was quite disturbing to say the least. I contacted the office of Nebraska Governor Dave Heineman to get his assessment of the situation and to find out if measures were being put in place to address the problems. Governor Heineman's media representative responded via email and basically said they were aware of the problems and plan to examine and monitor the situation more closely. Have serious efforts on the part of the state and city officials been made to resolve the issues? No, it hasn't, because what's happening is is that you have two different lifestyles. You have people that believe in personal property and the right to have business on one side of the reservation line, which is Nebraska, and then on this side you have more of a corporate community-minded people and you have these two forces butting heads. You know, I believe in small business and I believe that entrepreneurs should be able to make money, but not at the cost of killing people. And one of the things that I know that is the white clay issue will never change until the Pine Ridge Reservation begins to open up alcohol sales on the reservation. And, you know, the government really, they have their hands tied. Because, for one thing, they have to protect the business owner's rights to sell. And it's not illegal to sell alcohol in White Clay, Nebraska. But there are some issues there because, for one thing, people are drinking on the streets. They're urinating. They're getting beer for for sex. I mean, people are selling their bodies to get beer. There's prostitution going on there. There's fighting. There's a lot of destructive behaviors in White Clay, Nebraska. And the local police department doesn't have enough money to actually police it. And if they took everybody down 22 miles to Rushville, Nebraska, where the jail is, they wouldn't have enough room. Because every day they would actually have to pick up people and take them down to the, to the county jail. But they don't have enough money to police it. And Pine Ridge, the Oglaw Sioux tribe, does not have jurisdiction in White Clay, Nebraska, because it's in the state of Nebraska. So, you know, the state level, I mean, nothing can be done. 
you know, one of the things that, that I look forward to is a lawsuit, you know, going against the United States government for the conditions of the reservations like Pine Ridge. I mean, there are four counties in South Dakota, all reservations, and they are part of the top 10 poorest counties in the nation. And just this last week, they had an article that said the Native American reservations in South Dakota are the poorest of all Native Americans within the United States in South Dakota. Do you believe racism is a key factor oh, as far as lackluster response by political leaders is concerned? Definitely. You know, not only political leaders, but banking. Because we have a trust agreement with the United States government on our land, the racism that comes out is through banking and hiring practices. You know, in some of these smaller towns, the surrounding communities, in both in South Dakota and in Nebraska, you know, people cannot get bank loans because they don't have collateral. They don't have a means to, to pay back. And so hiring practices and banking, you know, there's a lot of racism involved, racism and prejudice. And for a long time, people have known that Western South Dakota is considered to be the Mississippi of the North. But it's not for African Americans, it's for Native Americans. And the Native American people have been fighting prejudice and racism you know, on a daily basis throughout Western South Dakota and Western Nebraska. Okay, clear something up for me. You used to believe that racism is definitely at play here, but given what you've just stated about residents not being able to get bank loans and things of that nature, that's more of an economic issue as opposed to a racism issue, is it not? They have no means or income. Okay, let, let me give you an example, Okay, Gary. We have a, a federal employee who actually probably makes about, I would say, between one hundred and forty dollars and $160,000 a year. And he was looking to open up Subway. And he could not get a loan across the border. I mean, this guy's making good money. You know, and, and the banks would not give him a loan. Why? Because he lives on the reservation and, you know, he's Indian. They wouldn't state that. But then we know of a, one of the banks in the border towns, they actually had a lawsuit against them because the loan process that was being done toward Native Americans with high interest rates, you know, whereas non-Indians were getting better interest rates and Native Americans were getting larger interest rates. So, I mean, there are things that, that are documented, but because of the United States government and their refusal of allowing the reservations to grow, it's very difficult for us to get loans. Pine Ridge recently lost a beloved member of the community back in October of 2012. Many have described him as a true activist and warrior, and you called him your mentor. Russell Means passed away while fighting to protect and save his community and people. Yet, the devastation continues. Some would say he died in vain. How would you respond to that claim? I would say Russell Means was the greatest American Indian in the 20th century. I mean, we could talk about Jim Thorpe and we could talk about Wilma Mankiller, but Russell Means did more for Native America than anybody else. I mean, he fought for the civil rights of American Indians because before 1973, Indian children were being taken away. There was no freedom of religion. And all the policies of the United States government were to destroy the Indians. And now you have the Indian Child Welfare Act, where that act alone says that Indian children should go to Indian homes. You know, now we have freedom of religion. You know, before 73, before Russell Means happened on the scene, you know, with the American Indian movement, they had no freedom of religion. You had to be Christian. It was forced Christianity. And now you have freedom of religion. So people could actually worship any way they want. The other thing is the Self-Determination and Education Act. You know, now the United States government policies are for self-determination. But there's so much red tape because of the trust issues that it's very difficult to overcome them. You know, our tribal government is an IRA government. It's an it's a Indian Reorganization Act. And what they did was they actually, when they're getting sworn in, they swear to uphold the United States Constitution. They don't swear to uphold the Oglala Sioux tribal constitution first, but they swear to uphold the United States Constitution. So they become agents of the United States government. And everything has to be passed through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we don't truly have sovereignty. You know, and, and that's one of the things that we need to do. And, and Russell means one of the things that he shared, because he, he wrote my foreword, 
he said, Leon understands what we need. And what it is, is it's freedom, you know, true freedom. I mean, as the great Sioux nation, as Lakota people, we need our freedom, freedom because we are the first people of this continent. And the United States came in and the European Americans came in and stole all the land and all the resources. All the gold is being taken up and Native America has been left in poverty. And he understood that. I mean, he was a great friend of mine. He would take time and he would share with me. And, and when I was in some of the darkest times in my life, he gave me advice. And, and I thank him for that. And I truly believe that he will go down as the greatest Native American in the 20th century. I mentioned Governor Heineman earlier. And I'm just wondering, have you had conversations about the situation at Pine Ridge with, say, your state senator or your congressman? I used to work across the border to help with the white clay issue. And I did that in the late 90s. And, and one of the things I realized right away is that because of jurisdiction with the tribe and with Nebraska, those things are not going to be solved. And the only thing that can solve them is if the Pine Ridge Reservation actually opens up alcohol sales. And then the white clays will disappear. And then we will have the personal responsibility and the corporate responsibility as a tribe to deal with our own problems. Right now we can say, that's Nebraska that's doing that to us. But no, 80 to 90% of the people are probably consuming alcohol on the reservation today. I know that might be a little bit high, but even if we say 50 to 60% of the people are consuming alcohol on a daily basis or weekly or monthly basis, we're still not taking responsibility for our own tribal members. You know, we don't have centers to fight the addictions on the reservation. You know, we need our own people to help overcome those issues. And we have to take responsibility as a tribe and as a community to deal with our own problems. And that goes all the way from, from, the, from the children and educating them as well as helping with addictions. Because alcohol is a symptom. And, and the symptom comes from a deep-rooted issue of abandonment, loss of culture, loss of a way of life. They took away the role of the man. When the reservation system was created, you no longer needed a hunter. You no longer needed a protector, provider. And what they did is they took away the role of the man. And so now there are many homes across the reservation that are growing up where the children do not have fathers. And so what we need to do is reinstall the fathers and give them an opportunity to actually provide and protect for their children and their families. If there's anyone that you'd like to personally address regarding the situation in Pine Ridge, please take this opportunity to do so. You know, I'd like to address the Tribal Council. The Tribal Council has a, has a lot of say across the reservation, and Pine Ridge has been a trailblazer in many issues. And now it's time for us to truly be sovereign. And for that sovereignty to happen, you know, we need to own up to our own responsibility of our people. For me, I try to be positive, but this is an issue that's never going to go away until we actually stand up and start acting as adults and not as children or wards of the United States government and take personal responsibility and corporate responsibility as a tribe to make changes for our children, which are our future. This is my opinion. And I know that it's very controversial, but I believe that until we start becoming adults, you know, we're, we're going to continue to struggle. Thank you for being here, Pastor Matthews. All right. Thank you, Gary. You've been listening to the G-Man interviews. Until next time, stay cool, stay safe, and stay informed. <laughs>